first. Good what place? Job. First. First, you, cheeky booger. Nice Good race. Job, Good job, girl. sweetie. In a world where dreams ignite the engines of possibility, Lacey Cool defies the odds and embarks on a remarkable journey that will test the very limits of her spirit. As a Florida native, she races not only for victory, but also for a cause greater than herself. Lacey Cool has been blazing a trail on the racetrack since 2014, but her purpose extends far beyond the finish line. With her charity, Drive for Diabetes Awareness, Lacey races to spread awareness about the symptoms of diabetes and to honor the survivors of diabetic ketoacidosis. Driven by a personal tragedy, Lacey's mission is to ensure that no family suffers the devastating loss she experienced. In 2010, her baby brother Rocco lost his life to DKA just two weeks after his first birthday. Misdiagnosed with a virus, his condition worsened, leaving an indelible mark on Lacey's heart. Lacey is determined to represent her charity on the grandest stage for the very first time, the Alaskan Junior Iditarod. Guided by the memory of Rocco, Lacey's determination knows no bounds. She defies expectations, blazes her own trail, and races with a purpose that ignites a flame in the hearts of all who witness her remarkable journey. This is her story. It usually takes about two years to train somebody up to actually run a dog team in a race. In all honesty, she's not the first young person I've asked if she'd be interested. She's the first one to say, yeah. She had this drive in her that people her age just don't really have. From sand to snow, from driver to musher, from Florida to Alaska. was invited by the Torque Memorial Foundation, Tyron Torkelson. The Torkelson Memorial Foundation was started in honor of my brother, Mark Torkelson. Avid snowmobile racer up here in Alaska. He raced the uh, Iron Dog 18 times. He won it in 1989 with Scott Davis on Yamaha snowmobiles. And we were just trying to honor his name a little bit and keep, uh, keep a tradition going that he loves snowmobiling, help in hand. He is known as the greatest field mechanic alive. We just started the foundation to continue what he was doing. It's all about the kids and snowmobiling and snowcross and my nephew Travis Torkelson has probably sponsored about 200 kids in, in snowmobiling. And they run the torque sticker on their sled and they love it. The Cool family across my news feed on Facebook, Lacey Cool's Racing came across and so I started watching it. The more I watched it, the more content came to me. And then I started messaging, hey, where's this at? Where are you guys at? What's the track record? How fast are you guys going? And then Brent's like, man, I'd love to come to Alaska and race. My dad messaged him and they started contacting each other about racing in Alaska. So they flew me up here. We had a whole bunch of people, the whole community in Alaska came together uh, to get uh, me a car ready, Airbnb flights, everything. And with some of my sponsors within 10 minutes, we pretty much had everything but the airline tickets. Michelle Lackey, the lady who runs Alaska Raceway Park, and Erica, they got housing, car rental, Bomer with Bomer Services. They donated a car, and then Bill's Distributing with 907 wraps, put a wrap on it just like she has down in the States. Okay, 
get in the car and do a shake down. Hi guys, Lacey Cole here. Uh, races at Alaska Raceway Park have been canceled due to rain. We unfortunately got rained out the two weekends that we were here. And since that happened, uh, I was invited by a fellow racer who is also a musher, Nicholas Petit. The mushing community is a pretty tight-knit community, and Scott Jansen, or we all call him the mushing mortician, after he was done running dogs, he started racing race cars with Lance Mackey, who's a famous Iditarod musher, who's won the Iditarod in the Quest four times each in a row. Mushing led me to the racetrack to support my friends, and those guys put me behind the car and said I can drive Lance's car because Lance wanted me to drive it. That's how I met Lacey. She passed me a few times <laughs> around the track. <laughs> Nick, Nick uh, when it comes to racing, I'll give him some more tips. He's a musher. He goes out there and has fun racing the car. So we had to rain out at the racetrack. And so I offered all those guys to come on over and experience what I do for a living in the summertime. I do a dog tour. So I gave, him a, I gave the whole crew a free ride and showed them what we do. And, and then I mentioned that there's a race called the Junior I Did Run. Thought that Nick was crazy, which he is just a little bit, but it's okay. And uh, three days uh, I was at the kennel. She came to scoop poop for three, four days and said yes. The reason I said yes was because of the dogs. I'm a dog lover. We have Ketone, our 105 pound German Shepherd back at home. And the dogs really grab your heart. And I thought it would be an amazing experience to learn from Nick. In all honesty, she's not the first young person I've asked if she'd be interested. She's the first one assertive enough to say, yes, I'm gonna do it. The other thing is some people can take constructive criticism and some people can't. And I watched her at the racetrack and not argue about we need to do this or that. Just, yep, that's what needs done. We're doing it. And that's the type of person it takes. Nick didn't train me the way I thought he would. But now that I think of it, it was a lot better way of him to train me. But that forced me to learn more on my own and how to do this stuff properly without him there babysitting me, telling me every second what to do. Honestly, I was really smart by Nick because there are some things I would not have been able to get through if it wasn't for that. I get a lot of thank yous for putting her on the trail, but anybody that's running dogs of mine is putting their sweat equity into the equation. Training your dog team is about knowing that team. I drive my team, which is not the same team that she was gonna be running. The people that have been running those dogs really should be the ones that, to show her the ropes on that team. We call them handlers, they, dog handlers. Caden and Artie, who had run that team before, took her out on her first few runs with small little dog teams, because I have to drive big team to get my big team ready for all the races we do in a season. Meanwhile, the other dogs still need to go running. I'm 
There was a whole bunch of people involved in training me. I was working with Caden, uh, Caden Foster, and Artie, Lou Schrader. I was training with them really for the 40 days. My name is Caden Foster, and uh, I've been working with Nick here for a couple of years. My name is Louis Schrader. I go by Lou. I'm originally from Kingston, Washington. I moved up to Alaska in, in the early, early 80s to be a Bering Sea crab fisherman. Nick had posted that we were going to have a junior musher sometime in summer uh, in, in like July. And I called him up immediately. I was like, wait, who, who is this? Where did you meet this girl? And he's like, yeah, she, she's from Florida. She's 16 and she's going to come up and run junior Iditarod. And I was like, you, you're you doing what with who? And you think bringing a girl from Florida is like this great idea? She's never even seen snow. Like, are you crazy? You're going to give her a dog team? Out of all of the 16 year old girls that might have wanted to run a dog team like she was very very driven and definitely like uniquely um, I don't know willing to do just about anything like she had no issues putting in the hard work and, and the long days and dog mushing isn't an easy sport. It usually takes about two years to train somebody up to actually run a dog team in a race and spending just less than two months teaching her she did exceptionally well. Especially for distance mushing like you, it's a minimum of 20 miles when you go out on a training run and um, that's an hour and a half of hooking up and probably four hours out on the trail and then an hour and a half of unhooking and doing dog chores back at the kennel. So uh, even with a short training run, like it's a half day commitment. I, I like helping people that, that want to do things and she was definitely on a mission. She had this just this inner drive in her that, that people her age just don't really have and she had a, a mindset that she was going to do this no matter what. In be before the start, though, I, we did go on a, on a run all together. So Artie and Lacey and I all went out and uh, did a long camp, a lot like she was going to have to do at Yetna Station. I think Lacey, at that night, she might be, it might be her first time sleeping in a sleeping bag. And she was doing it just under the skies, uh, no tent. It was just uh, below zero temperature. That was pretty impressive. I just moved to Alaska from Miami, Florida. I spent there like 10 years. So I know how big of a difference it is between Florida and Alaska. Okay, so Lacey, cool. You just got done running. Oh, you left at 6.30 yesterday, and you got back about 6.30. So tell us a little bit about it, and how was that run? The run was fun. We were out there with Nick and Artie, and we were camping. I got, like, eight hours of sleep. We kind of stayed there a while. I mean, I didn't need eight hours, but, you know. Did you see anything up in the sky? Yeah, we had northern lights. Yeah, and then we were also on the Junior Iditarod Trail, which is the Iditarod Trail. And um, that was cool. Uh, it was a, when like hills. When I thought I see a hill out here on our property where we normally run, uh, those trails are definitely different. The hills are very steep. <laughs> it's a pretty wild experience. You could see that she was enjoying what she was doing. Uh, she really liked spending time around the dogs and learning stuff and trying new things. I showed her how sometimes. You got to help the dogs push the sled, pull the sled, and get up that hill. And uh, that I'm pretty sure she appreciated that whole training run once she went on the race and was exposed to that hill again. It's, it's kind of steep. So. The day before the race, as anticipation fills the frosty air, Every dog team must go through a meticulous checkup to ensure their fitness for the challenge that lies ahead. think about all this this is really cool so yeah so you know I'm like like functioning I'm functioning on very little sleep but this is this is awesome these dogs are amazing she's doing a great job 
Like this day here, I haven't seen snow in 20 some years. It's beautiful, I love it. I'm excited, I can't wait for tomorrow. I'm just like ready to, I'm ready to roll, I'm ready to see you do a thing, so I am still stoked. <laughs> I would normally like we go back straight away from this guy, they're waiting for each other. Oh. We moved Joey's house. Hi, right, Joey. Come on, Joey. Joey. Would you have imagined that she'd be doing this? Not in a million years, no. You know, because when I've always taught to Lacey about racing, I'm like, what would you race? She goes, I'll race anything, given the opportunity, you know? Do they ever think it would be dogs in the sled? No, never. But you know, when she decided to do it, I mean, I told her, I said, you really got to think about what you, whether you want to do it, because this is tough. She's never been in these elements before. She was like, why would I say no? She goes, this is an opportunity. She goes, and I'm just going to go for it. Hi, Gold. Gold was being a little mean today. Gold was? I was yeah, I was surprised. Did he, did he pulled you and let you fall? Yeah. And did you get it on camera? Yeah, they got it on camera. Who and got then, it? Chris? That's very important to you. <laughs> Volunteer expert veterinarians armed with compassion and expertise meticulously examine each dog, assessing their health and well-being. It's a vital step in ensuring the safety and welfare of these incredible athletes. What do you do? I'm a retired veterinarian. I've been working with the Junior Iditarod since 79. And uh, these dogs are really good. They're, they're nice. God's good. Thank you. Do you volunteer? Yeah. Uh, help out? Yep, yep. And uh, this is just, it's really nice this year. Oftentimes it's really cold standing out here. Yeah, mm -hmm. right. <laughs> Yesterday was a little too warm for me. It was raining while I was on the trail, so. You won't see that very much. <laughs> no. Huh? It's supposed to cool off. It's supposed to, it doesn't look like, well, it was supposed to clear up. I don't know that it will or not. Okay, yep, so you should be all set. Okay, awesome. All right. After a Thank thorough you. examination, a nice volunteer veterinarian gives Lacey confirmation that her team is fit and ready for the challenge that awaits them. The weight of responsibility is lifted, replaced with a sense of assurance. Just going to go through my sled, make sure I have everything. I'm going to defrost my gloves, my extra gloves I have. I have a bunch of booties. That like if the dog takes them off, like while we're racing, or when we like stop, I put my booties in here. So this is the 46th annual Junior Iditarod. So welcome, and we have a great field of 16. <laughs> The race begins on the glistening expanse of frozen Kanik Lake, a stage set for epic feats of endurance and determination. Here a symphony of sled dogs and the beating hearts of mushers merge, ready to embark on an unforgettable journey. Amid the electrifying atmosphere, Lacey Cool arrives at the pulsating heart of the race, the start-finish line. The culmination of her tireless efforts and unwavering determination is about to unfold. With a laser-like focus, Lacey meticulously prepares her sled and gears, ensuring that every piece is in place. Each item is essential, a lifeline connecting her to the dogs that will carry her through the frozen wilderness. In the midst of the preparations, Lacey's unwavering focus is momentarily diverted. A young fan wide-eyed and eager, holds out a sign adored with her name. 
As the moment of truth arrives, Lacey Cool finds herself at the precipice of destiny. For the start of the race, when I was going up to the line with the dogs, I had Caden holding the dogs, I had Nick, I had Artie, I had Doug Sheldon, Brenda. We had a, a whole bunch of people help me up there to the line, and I was calm. I knew that if I was calm, the dogs would be calm, because they really sense your feeling when you're on the slope with them. With a firm grip on the sled's handlebars, Lacey feels the powerful pull of her determined sled dogs. Their muscles coiled with anticipation. Their primal instincts and unwavering loyalty merge with her own fierce determination. When they said one, two, three, and then I pulled the snow hook and went, I mean, I was just going. I knew I had 75 miles to get to Etna. One by one, the mushers are released onto the vast expanse of Kinnick Lake. The trail stretches out before them, a maze of ice and snow, beckoning their spirits to brave the unknown. And with each release, trackers are activated, pinging their location for family and friends to follow their progress. Lacey Cool's journey through the Junior Iditarod is a test of endurance and strategy as she sets her sights on reaching the crucial checkpoint at Eagle Quest Lodge. As Lacey Cool ventures deeper into the Alaskan wilderness, she embraces the challenges that come with the territory. Into the race, her team takes a faithful turn onto the wrong path, disrupting the steady rhythm of the journey. So I seen, um, there was, I knew there was a fellow musher behind me and I wanted to get out the way because I knew he was faster and I knew his team uh, he was going to pass me anyways, and I didn't want to be in the way. So there was a trail to the right, and I knew I didn't want to go down it. Um, I just wanted to get the dogs off to the side, so I said, Jeep, but then I realized that was a bad mistake because then they were all going to go to that trail. Amidst the confusion, Lacey's voice resonates with authority as she commands her team to halt. However, in the midst of the mix-up, the sled line becomes tangled. Threatening to impede her progress, she swiftly tackles the issue at hand. The unexpected unfolds. Lacey's sled tips over, burying her GoPro beneath the snow. We lose visual contact and the lens that had captured her journey up until this point falls silent. Unaware of the technical hiccup, Lacey forges ahead. She reaches the Eagle Quest checkpoint, a pivotal milestone in the race. At the checkpoint, Lacey's focus remains on her team, ensuring their well-being and tending to their needs. The race continues and she embarks on the next leg her eyes fixed on the horizon, her teeth propelled by the bonds forged on the trail. Eight long hours after the mishap. All right, so I think the battery's been dead this whole time. I just realized on the GoPro, but yep, we're almost to yet. During a strategic two hour camp, as instructed by her trainer, Nicholas Petit, Lacey seizes the opportunity to gather her strength and fortify her team. I had to camp for about two hours. Uh, I was told by Nick that I should do that. Keep dogs happy. Mushing dogs, it's, it's really a lot of mental and knowing that if you take it easy now, you'll be able to maintain your speed. Uh, if you go look at the tracker, that girl did exactly what she was supposed to do. Take it easy, camp, 
long enough to make sure that the trip home would be a fun trip where we could gain on others versus being caught up. Amidst the serene grandeur of the Alaskan wilderness, the temperature is dropped to a bone chilling minus 20 degrees Fahrenheit, testing the metal of both musher and dogs alike. As the hours wear on, Lacey perseveres through the frigid night, her dedication unyielding. The GoPro becomes a witness to her unwavering determination, each frame telling a tale of fortitude and resilience as she navigates the trail with her loyal team. passing moment, the moon casts a silvery glow upon the icy expanse. Lacey's journey becomes a testament to her unrelenting spirit as she forges onward, pushing through the challenges that have befallen her. Finally, at 11 p.m., the hour of endurance and determination. Lacey arrives at Yetna Station. The temperature has reached its coldest point, yet her spirit blazes with unwavering resolve. Waiting to receive her are the race officials and a familiar face, Lou Schrader, one of her mentors during training. Well, I was, I was out at Etna Station more as an observer than anything else. And uh, um, as an observer, and they're going through their wilderness experience, they had to, had to do things on their own. So all I could do was observe, take pictures, and that, that was about it. I figured out when her, when her out time was going to be. And, and next morning when she was getting ready to leave, I, I, I stood up on, on the hill and, and took some pictures of her going by. We just got a couple more minutes and Lacey will be leaving. She's got a super happy team. They're excited to get going. She's excited. She's got a big smile on her face. And we'll see her down on the river. Good morning, everybody. Here we are at Yetna Station. It's a little after 9 o'clock. Lacey Cole's getting ready to pull out. You can hear her dogs in the background. She leaves at 9.19. It's minus 14 at the lodge, minus 21 down here on the river. Sun's coming up, it's gonna be a beautiful day. Uh, leaving Yetna, we had some issues with a snow hook. I took my snow hook out and uh, I don't ex I don't know exactly what happened, but there was a rope, I tripped on the rope and I didn't get the snow hook when I got it undone. Uh, and then it went under the sled, so I had to stop the team, fix that. And then about two miles down the trail, I got really dizzy, I was like, 30 seconds ahead of where I was before, somewhere around there. So I turned the team around and uh, I told Shuby and Vance on my two leaders, I said, checkpoint, almost there. And then they just took me exactly where we just came back from. Uh, I was about one and a half, two miles away. I didn't have to tell them where to go. They already knew the trail from when we got there last night. So those dogs basically saved my life. It is Shuby and Bansaw who bear the weight of responsibility, tasked with leading their musher back to Yetna Station. I was sitting on the sled with my head like this, and I, I didn't even know we were there yet. And um, I started getting really dizzy, and the sled tipped over when the dogs turned into Yetna. And um, I don't know if I blacked out at that point, uh, but I'm pretty sure I woke up again. I had people holding the dogs. I flipped the sled back, 
and then I had someone holding my sled with the brakes with the dogs. I'd gone to bed the night before after I've spoken to her dad on the phone, Brent, and everything was great, you know. She was going to leave in the morning, 10 hours later. So he calls me in the morning, and so she just left. The dogs look great. But then she turned around, and she's coming back. We don't know why, but like I don't have kids. That's the closest to having a kid I ever had. I mean, I got dogs, my kids. But it's a, one more responsibility in, in my mind as a young person out there. Really, I thought when I got in the Yetna station, uh, I was really worried. Um, I was wondering if my team was okay. <laughs> I had some high uh, Kool-Aid, I had a whole bunch of food. I still don't know what happened to me out there uh, or why this happened. But yeah, I knew the team could have made it. I feel really bad because uh, I know the dogs would have enjoyed running the whole way back. Uh, we did have the race marshal Dakota run them 30 miles to Eagle Quest. Sucks that we didn't get to finish. I know we could have finished if we didn't have that, uh, some health issues, but. Here's the deal. You can act like a tough person and just persevere. But that tough-minded person that persevered, that might have should have turned around and went back, can be in real peril out there. Yeah, it's peril for the person, but they're tough-minded, you, so you're proud of the person for persevering. But if they have an issue out there because they persevered, who's also gonna be in peril? It's the dogs. So you have a medical emergency and you don't know if you're gonna be okay, you gotta get them dogs back to some place where they will be okay. So oh, she did everything right. This year's Blue Harness Award, um, there was a little bit of a medical emergency out on the trail and uh, this lead dog turned around and brought the team back to the checkpoint. So this award goes to Lacey's lead dog. So right here I have the Blue Harness Award. Uh, this award was voted in by the mushers. Uh, this is for the lead dog that did something extraordinary. Basically, that's what the Blue Harness Award is for. And this was rewarded because Shuby and Bansaw, really, I was too dizzy and lightheaded and everything to probably even find my way back on the trails to uh, go back to Yetna. And when I told them to go to the checkpoint, uh, this is Nick's best leader, Shuby, and then Bansaw was right there with him, and they brought me back. So this award goes to Shuby and Bansaw for saving my life, basically. Uh, so those dogs really, really deserve this. I think it's really great that they considered a team that didn't make it to the finish line for getting that award. I think that's fantastic. She wasn't feeling good and she told the bleeders to turn around, which is a hard feat to turn around an eight dog team on a narrow trail. And these and, and she told Shuby, her leader, hey, turn around. And without it without even a hesitation, he did it. And he made the whole team turn around without any tangles or anything. And obviously she had made some type of a bond in just that short period of training that Shuby trusted her because a dog just doesn't turn around just for the heck of it. That, 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 that's an amazing lead dog. And the bond between the two of them had to be strong. The road not taken by Robert Frost. Two roads diverged in a yellow wood, and I, sorry that I could not travel both, and being just one traveler, long I stood, and looked down one trail as far as I could to where it bent in the undergrowth. Then I took the other, as just as fair, and having perhaps a better claim, as because it was grassy and wanted wear, though as for the passing there had worn them really about the same. And both that morning equally lay and leaves no step had trodden back. Oh, I kept the first for another day, yet knowing how leads lead on to ways, I doubted if I should ever come back. I shall be telling this with a sigh, as somewhere ages and ages hence, 
Two roads diverged in a wood, and I, I took the one less traveled by, and that has made all the difference. So kudos to all of you. I love you all. Thank you very much for having me. So are you going to be back? We'll see. <laughs> I mean, I would like to come back. So, yeah. So I'd just like to credit a couple people. I'd like to credit Nicholas Petit, Caden Foster, Artie, Lou Schrader, Visitor Bros Studios. I'd also like to thank Mike Dillard, The Green Zebra uh, in Florida, back in Florida. Thank you guys so much for sponsoring me. Uh, you guys are awesome. A big thank you to the Tort Memorial Foundation. This would have never happened if it wasn't for you guys. A uh, big thank you to Matt Brown with Operation Children's First. Thank you to Doug Sheldon. A uh, big thank you to everyone that has given me I, tips, giving me uh, supplies to help me. I know there was a lot of people that put stuff together. Thank you to Anna Barrington and Christy Barrington for the sled. Scott Jansen. Uh, thank you to the Junior Iditarod Committee with the trail committee uh, and everyone that put that race together. Overall, this has been an amazing trip. Uh, we've spread brochures all around Big Lake, Anchorage, Wasilla, uh, wherever we've gone, even Willow. I think even up to Fairbanks. <laughs> so we've uh, covered a wide variety of places in Alaska with diabetes and telling people about it. And just the mushing community, you guys are awesome. To ev everyone that I raced against was so nice. The mushers, uh, they're amazing people. And you can really tell that they love their dogs um, and that they care for them. So it's been an amazing experience. Remember to check, don't guess, it may not be the flu, and continue to spread diabetes awareness all over the U.S. and all over the world, hopefully in the future. I will see you guys later. Bye.